What's up, everybody? Aaron Wilbert, founder of The Coaches Site. Our producer is Justin Kwan, and you are tuning in to the Glass Now podcast. Hope you brought your notebook today as we have a great show. Barry Trotz is going to be joining us. Barry, of course, needs no introduction. Uh, before we jump into that conversation, just real quick, make sure you like and subscribe below and make sure that you stay up to date with all the great content that we push out through The Coaches Site YouTube channel. Also, if you're involved with the Minor Hockey Association or a Junior Development League, Go to thecoachesite.com forward slash groups to learn about our group membership program. In the last month alone, the BC Junior Hockey League, Alberta Junior Hockey League, Manitoba Junior Hockey League, Pacific Junior Hockey League, uh, the Austrian Ice Hockey Federation have all taken advantage of the opportunity to onboard their coaches at super discounted rates. Uh, so again, that's the coaches site dot com forward slash groups and you're going to join a global coaching community uh, of passionate coaches from all over the world and with that let's get into our conversation with barry trotz coach good to see you thanks for joining us pleasure how are you doing I'm doing really well. It's uh, man, oh man, start of hockey season. How how are you feeling? What's this like for you uh, as we as we lean in here with lots of time on your hands? Uh, a little strange. Uh, I've had a very busy summer with family things that I had to take care of. Um, a lot of traveling. I've been living on a suitcase since May, um, so I haven't had a lot of time to to think about the game and and that. Uh, but as the preseason started. Uh, I've been sort of following it a little bit more and I'm, I, I, I do feel a little strange that uh, everybody's at uh, training camp and, and that, but uh, uh, the blessing is that I had some family things I had to take care of and uh, they're getting done. Uh, but I, I am a, a little bit of a, a sponge to the, what's happening in the, in the game. So I'm following the game, getting a lot of uh, phone calls from uh, people that are working in the business. Uh, asking for a advice or, or thoughts, and uh, that's kept me in it a little bit. Uh, but uh, it's mentally, mentally, it's been refreshing uh, not having to grind through everything from uh, you know setting up your training camps and personnel and all that, uh, dealing with coaches, GMs, uh, scouts. Haven't had to do that all summer, so uh, that has been uh, uh, a little bit refreshing. At the same time. Uh, uh, it's been, uh, I say, a blessing because there's things that I, I put off or needed to do and they're getting done. So, uh, But I'm, I'm, I miss being in the locker room. I miss being in that, that fight with, uh, and just uh, with, the, with the coaches. Uh, there's, there's good people in the game and uh, that part I, I will miss for sure. Uh, but uh, I'm sure once I get everything done that I need to get done, uh, I'll be uh, a caged animal for a, a little bit and being more, I'll be watching a lot of hockey. I bet. Well, you know what, like I've got a, just a ton of questions just to get your perspective on, you know, this upcoming season. But uh, first I, I'm good planning a trip to Nashville this, this season. Uh, never been before. And I know that you uh, recently, I don't know if you relocated, but you, you, you yeah, bought a place there. Back. Um, so for, for a first timer, like what's, what's on the Barry Trotz must do, uh, list oh, in Nashville. That's, that's easy. I, I think I could, I'll give you a four or five day trip to Nashville. And I say this to <laughs> four or five, okay. almost every, every, everybody who comes and depending on the, on the, your, your age and who you're coming with, uh, to, to visit, uh, I can tell you Nashville is a great, has great energy and that's the music, the people, all that. It is a foodie, a foodie town. Uh, and there's lots to do there in terms of attractions uh, be it sports, uh, be it uh, if you're into the country music and some history uh, in that area. But uh, I would come in if I were you. They Usually the Preds play on Thursday night. I'd come in Thursday afternoon. I'd head over right over to uh, the hotel. I'd check in and then I'd make my way over for, to Tootsie's for some live music and yeah. Tootsie's and Legends Corner and uh, have a few pints and then uh, – uh, probably have something something to eat and go over to the uh, the Preds game that night and then uh, uh, after the game I would head up Broadway and just start uh, honky tonking it a little bit and getting the, the lay of the land uh, on Friday I would probably get up and do a tour of the Ryman uh, 
Ryman, and the, Ryman, the Ryman Auditorium, and then, and then I go over to the Country Music Hall of Fame. Uh, for lunch, I would go over to Jack's Barbecue. Uh, for, after that, I would probably do a little uh, listening at a few few ven- venues. Uh, I'd probably go to the either the Grand Ole Opry, which is at the Ryman, or at the uh, uh, Opryland Hotel, depending on what time of year you're there on Friday and then uh, continue to go back to, I work second Avenue on Friday night and uh, printer's alley. So you get a lay of the land. Uh, Saturday morning, I would uh, go uh, get up and uh, you won't be getting up too early if you're um, doing a little bit of march through the uh, Broadway in second. No no kidding. uh, I I would head over to either uh, Vanderbilt uh, Stadium Oh, yeah. And take in a uh, college football game. Yeah. On, on Saturday, and I'd after the game, I'd probably uh, I'd go over to a, a, a nice restaurant uh, a little bit early. I would probably go to a nice steakhouse that's downtown or in the uh, in the Gulch area, and um, then I would go over to the Preds game, and then after the after the game, I I'd, I'd complete my tour of the. Uh, Broadway and in, in, in second a little bit there. Uh, Sunday morning, I would uh, get up and, and do the tailgating with the, the people at the Titans game. Uh, Sunday night, uh, I would have a nice, uh, I'd do some, uh, I'd head over probably somewhere in the uh, uh, 12 South area uh, and have some bite to eat. And I would probably go to Zany's Comedy Club's Sunday and I would wake up in, on Monday and, and get on a flight and go back home, and you'd, you'd fill in a lot of things. Uh, I, I feel like I need a, I feel like I'm going to need a holiday after the holiday to, to oh, no. recover. No, yeah. All that energy and, and the uh, and the barley sandwiches that you have, you'll be fine. You're okay. Gone. All right. Well, I took some notes there. I'm looking forward to it. Um, you know, Barry, you, you touch on just keeping track of um, what's going on in the league and. I don't know if it's, it seemed like this off season was, was maybe more dynamic than, than, than past just in terms of man, the amount of big trades, player movement, bunch of new coaches, man, like it feels like every team has a new starting goaltender. Is there any storylines, be it, you know, specific to a player or, or team that, um, you know, you find intriguing and are going to be keeping tabs on now that you've, you've got a, a fan hat on for a little while. Yeah, well, I, I think you know the, the, the this season or this off season to me, uh, obviously the uh, Kachuk and and Goudreau saga from Calgary and how uh, Trees has done an absolutely fantastic job of of filling the holes and and maybe making the team even even stronger. Yeah, I mean, really, really, when you look at it, it was Goudreau and Kachuk for for Cadre and Hubido, and then you throw in Weaker in there. Uh, I'm not sure Calgary's not a better team because uh, you know the, you've got the pedigree that uh, that Cadre and the edge that Cadre brings, and uh, Huberto is is one of the best you know uh, offensive players in the in the league, uh, and he's committed there. And Uyghur is a really good player. I know he was in the mix with the uh, with the Olympic team because I was on that uh, on that staff that was originally supposed to go there. And uh, he was in that mix, and he's a good, a really good hockey player. So they've gotten deeper. Uh, I think you know uh, that those storylines. But what stands out to me, and not not that there was, there was trades and there was movement, is that players are deciding where they're going to play now. They really are. It's almost like you know? the NBA a little bit, isn't it? Like yeah, I, I think so. They they recognize uh, that when they get to a certain point, that they are they're going to they're going to initiate some of that that movement and they, you know, uh, you know, I'm sure there was some kind of communication, uh, some way, somehow to Florida that he wanted to go there. Um, that, uh, that, that, that made that happen. So I, I think the league is changing the, the, for me, the, the players understand, uh, that they have some, they have the power yeah. uh, to make some of those decisions. Um, if, especially if you're, a, a, you know, a top, top player or an elite player, you're going to get to, to make those decisions and they're making them. They're, they're looking long-term, uh, be it organizationally that, 
they can maybe win a cup or maybe it's lifestyle. You know, you want to be in a nice warm place for uh, the next eight years. You can decide yeah. that. Um, so I think players understand that they, the, the, the shift of power, just they're watching it in the NBA. They're watching it in a little bit in baseball now, even like Aaron judge, uh, you know, is going, you know, he, I'm going to bet on myself. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just think that's the, the, what, the, the thing that I've noticed uh, shift probably in the last two years, maybe not so much last year because of the COVID and there was a, you know, a flat cap, but uh, I think that's where the game's going. I think that's the, the players understand that. And so if you have an organization, you're going to have to have all the elements to bring in top players. You're going to have to have a winning organization, a well-run organization. You're going to have to have a, a good team and you're going to have to have a, a good climate and a good culture. So you might need a beach at your disposal too. Like, yeah, you might need a beach at your disposal or at least, uh, you know, warmer weather, uh, you know, uh, that, that allows you. And, Trust me, uh, players look at uh, uh, quality of life, where they want to finish their careers, uh, the vibe in the city. They want to, you know, that where where they are in terms of taxes. You know, I, I moved out of uh, Long Island to go to back to Tennessee, where I had lots of roots, but taxes were a big uh, a big factor. I could save a lot on taxes by just really flipping houses from New York to to Tennessee. So. Um, and then players are, are think that way as well. I think, you know, they, they look at, uh, where they have history or where they might want to go. And, um, you know, media, you want to be under the eye of, uh, Toronto market, for instance, or Montreal market, yeah. or do you, you want to be, you know, somewhere else where maybe it's not quite as intense. Um, um, sometimes, uh, you know, some players thrive under being, you know, walking into a restaurant, everybody in the place know and they can't go anywhere, but they love the attention. Other players just want to be left alone, do their job and, and be a hockey player. And so those, all those things, everybody's sort of wired different. So uh, I, I think players are going to decide that uh, a lot more in the future. Yeah. Well, you know, I, 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 I struggle with this because, you know, I, I think hockey, you know, most of us are traditionalists and, and I always have to remind myself, like everything you just described there in terms of players being able to decide where they're going to live, you know, with their families, it's like, well, in all fairness, that's, that's the opportunity that's afforded to most people and they're, they're given profession. Yeah. So maybe that's fair, but I also know it. I, I, I don't know Daryl Sutter. You, you do, obviously. My sense is that if there's one coach that's going to take that script and kind of flip it and use it for motivation, oh. it, it's him. Like, I feel like he just got handed a, uh, couple aces up the sleeve so that i agree that's going to be an interesting one to watch uh yeah absolutely he's the best interview too and 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 he is a terrific he's a terrific human being uh, we both have special needs sons yeah and so we have a we have a connection and he's he really is he's uh uh i love listening to his his interviews and uh as we all do but he 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 he's I will say he's uh, he's smart like a fox. He, he he's always thinking thinking ahead, which um, some people don't know that about Daryl. He's he's very very thorough in his thought process. At this time of year, um, you know you got you're staring down an 82 game schedule, and I I always think it's interesting because we can all you know maybe pick who we think the contending teams are, but you know every year there's a couple teams that they just they just improve, they get better. And, um, and, and as it stands today, we don't know who those teams are going to be. How did you view, um, I guess, a season plan and, and how you would manage it to ensure that there was those incremental improvements and you were peaking at the right time come playoffs versus maybe getting out of the gates really quick, but then petering off as the season wore on? Well, I always, I always felt uh, that it was important to um, – get off to a good start. And, and I mean, what's a good start? You know, I, I looked at the, if you can be, you know, say first 10 games, be a six and four, that's acceptable. Yeah. You know, you're, you're in the mix and, and you're, you got to dig in. I've been on, I've had teams where we, uh, you know, we got off to, you know, a little less than 500, 500 start and, and had to dig in all year. I've, I've had some teams where we got off to, 
you know, 10 and one and we're, we're rolling. And, and really, uh, I think for me, you get off to those great starts. It's great for your organizationally for you because of the fact that, you know, you've, you've built up some equity, some, you got a little bit of wiggle room. Uh, but I think sometimes that hurts you because you always, you have that wiggle room, that urgency isn't there. So I, I always sort of look at it. I always, I don't look at really the 10 games overall and say, we need this many points. I know some coaches do. I look at the week. I, I've always believed in, in usually play three games a week. I need four points, four points this week. That's all we need. Those three games are been, That's and, really interesting. And, and if you're playing at that clip, you're going to be well over a hundred points. You'll be fine. And so I, I just sort of focus on the week. We need four points. We need four points. And if you end up getting six or six or seven, if you end up playing four games one week, it's, it's, it's bonus. And uh, I sort of don't get too far ahead because uh, when you, and I, and I saw that last year a little bit with our team is that, you know, we, we didn't get off to a great start. Then we got hit with COVID and we had all those uh, yeah. games that we had to play with pretty well a, a minor league team and fell behind the eight ball. And then we were, we were 10 or 11 games behind everybody else in terms of playing them. And so it was really hard to focus on the week because you, you know, you're 10 games in, in the, behind them in the standings, just playing them. And you're, you know, you're 22 points out. It, it was a mental uh, grind to try to focus on the week. It really was because you're going, okay, you know, the week wasn't going to do us any good. We went a week and we're, you know, you went from 22 to 21 points behind, you know, it, it, it was a little tougher that way, but uh, it was, a, it was a bizarre year for, for Islanders and Islander fans. And it was, it was tough. And that, that, that group had grinded a long time. Big the, time. The previous two, the previous two years in the bubble in the shortened season. And we have to play playoff hockey you know, all the time. To, to, yeah. To, to, Two arenas, like subways. Yeah. Just, yeah. And then, and then, you know, when you get shut down as many times as we did yes last year, you have to have these mini training camps. Yeah. Because I never thought about we went, that. We went through a stretch where I thought, okay, we're 10 games behind. They, we didn't go to the Olympics. We had to play the Rangers, Philly, uh, Devils a bunch of times. And I thought, oh, God, that's great. You know, uh, I was sad that uh, on a bucket list that we weren't going to get a, uh, uh, an opportunity to go to the Olympics. But on the other, on the other hand, I was going, okay, we're going to get some of our games. we get a rhythm. Our team was good when we had a, a rhythm. Yeah. And I thought, you know, they're going to pluck in a couple games there. Uh, we'll be fresh. We'll get a rhythm. And it, and it really didn't happen. We played two games in 31 days. And we, wow. we just couldn't get rolling. And then we finished up with, I, I can't remember the, the number. They were strange, like 50 games and 79 nights. So it, it just was very hard mentally and even physically for the, for the players uh, um, to, to try to catch up. And, and it, was a, it was a difficult season. And unfortunately, we didn't make it. And, um, and that group was a, a good, a really good group to work with. And, uh, you know. But uh, I, I did get to to coach uh, Sedano Chara, which was a well, he's a special human being. He's going to be missed in the league, man. He's got a lot of respect around the league, and not only from players but coaches. Anybody who's ever met him, uh, he's a first class guy. Well, I'll tell you what; it, it'll be fascinating to see what he does in the next stage of life because I feel like he could be an NHL general manager, but he could also go in a completely different trajectory. And again, this isn't from knowing him personally, but I just sense that he's, uh, uh, you know, a, a true professional and just a, an in, in incredibly bright man. He is. Uh, he's uh, well-versed. I think he speaks uh, five or six languages. Um, wow. He's uh, big time in real estate. He's very learned. He's always learning something. Um, whatever it is, uh, and I don't know, I I'm interested to see what he does next, uh, because whatever he does, he's fully committed to, um, and he's had a lot of life experiences. Uh, you know, he was, we were talking when he was growing up. I mean, he was behind the iron curtain 
And he's, no, yeah, he said, I guess, yeah, the time, yeah, crazy. He was, he was saying when they grew up, they used to have a speaker in everybody's house. And um, every Sunday from, you know, I can't remember if it was, you know, six or seven in the morning to midnight, basically. Basically, this it was the only thing that you could listen to was like a propaganda channel. And he says, Isn't that these, these, crazy. Yeah, they used to, to stick their basketball in the speaker to, to muffle it so they don't have to listen to it all day. And uh, he was telling me all, you know, the different things and uh, the, the untrust, because if you weren't, if you're behind a little bit of the Iron Curtain, if you weren't compliant, someone could turn on you and go, you know, they're not compliant, and yada, 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 and get in trouble. So we had some fascinating uh, conversations because uh, just because he's, you know, he's 45 years old and he came from a really unique background and worked his way to Canada and, and uh, had a, he's going to first, first ballot Hall of Famer, maybe one of the toughest oh, guys who ever yeah. played the game. At his peak, I don't know if there was anybody tougher than Zidane Chara. I mean, if you watched anybody who watched him last year, um, he was trying to pull us into the fight. He's 45 years old and he's taken on a lot of tough guys just to pull, pull us as a team into the fight. Well, I, I think, I mean, obviously didn't fight often, but I, I've always felt like that, you know, the, the clips of when he did, it was almost like watching shark week and like a shark attack. It's like the other, it just wasn't even a, didn't stand a chance whoever's up against yeah. him. So, um, you know, it, it's interesting, Barry, you know, there's so much talk today about, you know, the importance of diversity, you know, in the workplace. And just as you're talking, like, I'm thinking, man, like, you know, hockey, especially, um, you know, the diversity that exists in a, in a dressing room. And then as a leader and a coach, how you're developing relationships. Cause you know, man, oh man, like trying to connect with someone that has grown up in that environment that you described was in Ochara versus, you know, Matthew Barzell, that's, you know, from my neck of the woods out here in Vancouver, like just, both in terms of their age, life experience, like two totally oh, yeah. different spectrums. Like, how did you learn to, um, I guess, develop relationships and, and you know, and, and just earn players' trust? Because as you talked about, the transient nature of the league today, um, it's not like you got a multi-year runway to do that. You probably, every year you're showing up and you got a handful of players that you're, you're meeting for the first time. Yeah, well, I think number one for me is I try to, uh, I always look at myself, you know, how would I want to, you know, being a dad of, uh, my kids are now older. I thought it was great when my kids were in that, uh, you know, 17, 18, 19, 20, early twenties. And, and you're, you know, they put me onto all the trendy things, uh, that were happening and the music and the movies and the pop culture and all that. Uh, that was, that was helpful for breaking the ice with young players. Uh, and then, you know, players that had young families, I can, you know, I can relate with that. And as you get older in the league and then having the experiences in the league, I just think communicating so they understand. Um, I don't, I, I think everybody recognizes it's, it's a business and everybody wants to be a team guy. Um, but everybody sort of does look out, no different. Everybody looks after number one. Um, and, and you should, because it, the, the careers are short, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and you know, the players make great money, but people don't realize, you know, uh, depending where you live, I mean, a, a player making a million dollars and you're in a, a high tax province or state, you know, you're getting clipped pretty good. And then, you know, you go play in that Nashville, you're, there's a performance tax. You go play in California. Yeah. All of a sudden, you know, uh, what you were getting taxed, you got another, you know, probably six, seven percent on top of what you would normally, anybody would normally pay. Then you got, you know, another three percent for your agent. And then you got player dues and you got yada, yada. All of a sudden, that million dollars turns into about 300,000 really quick, uh, which is which is good money. But when you think about it, there's, you know, you've got to get to a certain level of games to really have a. And, and your career is going to be, you know, probably over unless you're a really good player around 33 or 34, you're probably out of the league. So, you know, you got, you got another 50 years to, to live. So people don't realize that, that, uh, and 
And I think where the where I'd like to see the league continue, and I think the PA has done a, a much better job uh, over time, uh, and will continue to do that. Is is teach that uh, team should teach that that uh, you know your signing, but your first signing bonuses and that get your get your nice car and all that, but put something away uh, nest egg wise so that because uh, the careers can be really short and that that money comes quick and it also goes out quick. So just uh, you know, I, I think it just in society uh, in schools they should teach uh, finance because everybody lives to their last dollar. It's thousand percent our, agree. Yeah, uh, you know that's probably the most important thing we can forget about world history for a bit and let's let's uh, you know. I have a special needs son and they teach them, you know, uh, you know, life skills. We need, we need some life skills in our, in our, you know, in just regular schools these days, uh, just because they're, they're, the kids are, are, uh, they're in a tough time. They're in a tough world going forward. Um, what's right and what's wrong. Is there an expiry date on, you know, what, what, what we could say in the, you know, I, I'm a born in the sixties. Uh, what I could say in the seventies and eighties would not be acceptable in the, you know, now. And, you know, so I think sometimes when we, we look back and go, you know, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm offended of what happened, uh, you know, a hundred years ago. Yeah, yeah. You would be in today's society, but a lot of us people didn't have a lot to do with it, but I get it. I get it. So I don't know. It's a transitional a time for especially young people uh, and even old, us, older, or us older people what what's acceptable now and what's you know you, a lot of people that I know um, that are you know my, like my dad and all that you know he'll say something and I'll I'll, I'll go what <laughs> and and but it was you know he doesn't know it's not acceptable to maybe a 20 year old you know so we're, we're, we live and learn a little bit. That we're, I, we continue to learn. It's a, a learning, a lifeline. A, learning's a sort of a, a lifelong process. And so, and the hockey's going through that. The diversity, yeah. The uh, you know what was you know played in the Western Hockey League. We were talking before this. Uh, you know, there was well, I had five guys that had four hundred penalty minutes. I mean, that'd be insane now. Um, the game's evolved, the uh, society has evolved, all that. So we continue to learn uh, all that. So, well, I think that's well to... said. I, I think that, um, you know, I think collectively we all got to give each other some space to, to evolve. And gosh, yeah. I mean, I, my, my grandmother, God rest her soul, was the sweetest human I'd ever met, but she said a few things that would have got her canceled from time to time. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And, doesn't, and, doesn't change and, that's why. That's why I mean. I don't know what the expiry date. If you were born in the '60s, you know, do you get a pass if you say something wrong? Do you get one pass or two passes? Or if you're born in the '80s, do you get a pass on something? I don't know. Um, but anyways, it's uh, it's wh- where society is uh, right now, um, and just the, the you know some of the respect around uh, um, you know I want to say not leaders but people that you know. Uh, you see all the violence in some of the, yeah. the cities and the policemen, how they, you know, they can't even take care of you. They're, you know, they, they had a pledge to, to protect and serve. And when they do it correctly, they still get in trouble. So it's, it's a weird time for everybody. Well, I, I, I like to think that um, we were, we're kind of in the, you know, the, the path to, to hopefully collectively kind of getting a bit more aligned as a, as a society, which, you know, fingers crossed that that's the case. Um, you know, Barry, speaking of the past, I, I wanted to go back to your first year as a head coach. You're, you're 23 years old, hometown uh, of Dauphin, Manitoba, the Dauphin Kings, great barn, by the way. Um, if you had a time machine and could go back and talk to a young Barry Trotz at, at that point uh, or on the onset of your career, what, what advice would you give him? I'd probably say, you know what, don't, don't try to control everybody. Hmm. I, I think what I, what I found when I was, when I was young, I tried to control everything and everybody, especially when I was a, a the head coach and GM. And what I, what I found with, uh, I think experience is that you don't have to control everything. You just have to find 
you only have to control the five or six really key people or elements in your in your team. And if you do that, it sort of teaches itself. It's no different than uh, if you look at a business, if you're a CEO and if you, you know, you hire good people and, and good managers and, and, and train them correctly and they manage down, you're going to have a good product. You're going to have a consistent yeah. culture. You're going to have all that. And I think uh, when I was younger, I just tried to control everybody. And so uh, when it didn't, you know, people, they lose their creativity. They lose that ability to, to take ownership. And so I learned to give ownership to them and uh, give trust. And uh, I, when, I, when I hire someone, I, I try to hire a really good person and I try to give them ownership and, and let them do what they do. And, and, and if I don't like it, I, I will, I'll just say, you know, hey, let's look at changing this a little bit and, and not getting too upset or, or pulling everything away from them. I just don't, I don't believe in that. I try to hire good people and, and let them use their skill set to, to make us better. Well, you know, you mentioned that, you know, that that's something you've learned. You know, I think if, if you pulled people in the, in, in the hockey community, I think, you know, they would sort of define Barry Trotz as being very calm and, and rational. Um, is that always been your demeanor or was that something that was learned as well from? Um, well, that was ago? learned. Okay. I was, uh, I, I think I, when I was, I was a rave. I thought when I look back, I'm going. No, no cell phones care. back in Dauphin in the eighties. Oh you. man, <laughs> raving, just a lunatic. I think. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 I wasn't very calm, and I was intense, and I was in your face, and uh, all that. But I think I've just learned to to calm it down and uh, try to try to be fair. I, I, I say. You know, you can't be scared to, and Torch is a good example of it, I think, in the league. He gets a lot of good play. You know, he's not afraid to to, to challenge a player to make them better. Yeah. You know, and I, I think I've been able to communicate that, that I'm not trying to, to, I'm challenging you to be the best version of yourself. If your game is, you know, uh, high-end, um, offensively but you don't have any any instincts defensively uh i try to get that nice balance where you know you yeah. can play in your own end so you have the puck more instead of chasing it around and and never having the puck because you're you can't be part of the solution um i want you to be part of the plan and the solution to get it back so you have it more uh if you don't have much of a, a offensive game how can we you know, establish a, a little bit of offense. A good example would be a guy like uh, Adam Pellich that I had in the, with the Islanders. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, great stick, great um, instinct from the defensive standpoint of the game. Got him to get some firmness in his game. Just that little edge to win battles and, and add that element. And then once he got that down, he became a, an elite defender and penalty killer uh, great instincts, and then you, you started adding some offense to his game by allowing him to to, to jump up and, and doing that. Looking for more what a player does really well and then obviously looking for what he doesn't do well and see if we can uh, sort of enhance both or get a real good balance so that uh, come playoff time, you're not a one-trick pony. You can play in those games. You can play in the, in the no-space games. You can play – when you know there's nothing happening for 56 minutes because teams are, are are going up and down and they're checking well and they're uh, you know they're not giving you any space and it's physical. How can you still stay in that 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 balance in your game where you don't cheat and and you give up something that you didn't have to? And to me, you know, there's a, there's a saying: it's not it's not necessarily what you get, but what you leave. Uh, if you don't leave anything. If you don't leave anything for the for the opposition, then you're going to get something because it's it's you're they're going to lose their patience and you're going to get a shot. And I think you see that teams lock that down. That teams that have that ability to lock that down uh, in playoff time, uh, they win. And talent always, you know, you got to have the talent. There's no question. Uh, but to me, you've got to have the, the the attitude and the mindset that. You know, it's not going to be like the regular season. Hey, we need a goal here. It's going to, we, you know, you, you, you turn it up for five, six minutes and you, 
and, and lo and behold, you, uh, you know, you, you get, get your goal or you get your chance, um, in the playoffs, it's, it's a lot tighter. So you might have to be doing that same thing for 56 minutes to get that one chance with four minutes to go and you, and you win the hockey game because scoring is just down in the playoffs and uh, space is limited and, and teaching players who have great skill sets that adding that, that ability to use that skill set uh, with the right amount of will and determination so that they can get to those hard places in the playoffs. That's, yeah. that's to me, uh, separates a team that's ready uh, to, you know, especially the leadership group. Um, you know, uh, I can go back to my uh, year we won the cup and that was my goal from day one with Ovi when I got there is to understand that he's still going to score in the playoffs. He's still going to do that, but you know, blocking, uh, blocking shots and, and being detailed offensively and, and shift length and line changes and all that stuff that really matters. Um, they really embrace that, especially if it's your leader. Yeah. And uh, Ovi, if, in the, you look at that playoff uh, that we won the cup, uh, it was Ovi and Kuznetsov that really bought into that. Not saying that the other guys didn't, but they went, I thought they came the furthest in that, that distance to really buy in that. And, uh, and we won a cup. And uh, they, they, they completed it, and now they want more. Once you get one, you want more. Uh, but it's the journey. It's not necessarily hardware. Uh, I haven't seen my, I have seen my cup, but, uh, you know, it, a lot of times it's in boxes, uh, yeah. you know, in storage. And to me, it's the journey. That's the, that's the thing. I think that's why uh, the, the picture that everybody cherishes when you win a cup is the one, it's not the one where you're, you're sitting a stoic uh, with the, the nice team picture with the Stanley Cup in front. It's the one where you know, after whatever, when you get that fourth win, and you're lying on the ice and guys are hooting and hollering. Those are the ones that are, that's the picture that you want. That's the one that you, you know, you don't want to ever lose. Uh, you know, you always want that picture. So uh, that's really, uh, to me, it's the journey. Um, and you, no player will ever be defined. Uh, I, I think uh, I talked to Ovi, I talked to, you know, even myself um, that, you know, you're not going to be defined by a piece of metal. You're going to be defined by how you, you uh, help people, how you yeah. influenced your family, uh, how you treated them. Uh, that's, that's how you're going to be remembered, not necessarily because you've got a piece of metal. And, uh, but the piece of metal is very nice. And it's a, it's a well, great that reward. Team certainly enjoyed it, Barry. We all saw evidence of that. Yeah. Well, and, and, and you know what? Uh, I and, remember and they, should. After, yeah, they did. And, and we set a pretty good standard. Uh, and, and I, and I, I'll take credit. I'll take some of the credit. I didn't do it, but I'll take some of the credit for, uh, uh giving them. Uh, I just, I told them, I said, when it was all done, this, this fan base here is incredible in, in Washington. Um, and I says, they really need you. I need you. You guys really need to take it to the streets. And, and share That's it with so this good. community. And they did. And they were fantastic. Uh, I know they, they got a little bit of little bit of criticism, but they 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 did it right. They did they, they there was so much scar tissue, if you will. Yeah. Uh, and how hard it was mentally for uh, this this area was tough because they had years and years of you know almost but something would go wrong. And I always said it was part of the Washington, not culture, but the, the media, it's the political yeah. media. Every, there's always something wrong. You know, they, they have a negative spin on everything. And we were able to, you know, uh, I noticed it when uh, coming out into the ice in the, when we first started the playoffs, I could write my name in the tension that was in that building because the, everybody thought something was always going to go wrong. And, uh, you know, we even got booed, and I think it was in the uh, in the conference finals. We were on a power play about thirty seconds in in the little power play. They started booing us in the in the conference finals. After the game, I said, "No, 
we shouldn't be booed. We need your help as a fan base. We're going to struggle at times, and that's when we need you to, you know, cheer for us. Yeah. That's when we need you support, not turn on us because you're got all this tension and you want to win a cup. We want to win it together. So after that, uh, that little speech, uh, um, I felt like I was a little bit like Phil Esposito. I was just going to say that. I was just going to say that. You totally. Are your <laughs> And uh, it's hard enough to win. We don't need you piling on too. And and so um, after that, our fans were, you know, that got out of the building and we were, we were fine. We were, we were going to win that cup. There was no question. Well, I have a few questions on, 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 on that run with Washington, but I, I want to just quickly go back to the Islanders. Cause um, one, you, you know, you talk about, um, you know, just, just getting to know players and, and define their strengths. And so that first year with the Islanders, you go to the conference final, just, you know, just amazing theater at NASA Coliseum that played out, but your fourth line, Matt Martin, Casey Sitzikas, um, mm-hmm. Cal Clutterbuck, you know, you know, particularly Matt Martin, who was kind of a castaway from Toronto. And I, I don't know if there's an analytic for, I mean, there's definitely an analytics. There's analytics for everything now, but I felt that that line in that playoff run, if you were to measure the amount of ice time they got, like their their impact on the team relative to the ice time they got was phenomenal. And I and I took I coached a a pee wee team in the North Shore Winter Club the, the next season, and I had that off season. I just reviewed all those tapes, and I that was the first thing I showed our kids that that like you all have different strengths, but we're all going to do this as as far as a, and they were, they were phenomenal. And I just felt like that. um, Yeah. Just that assembly. Cause I could see all those guys could have gone somewhere else and maybe don't find that same level of success. Yeah. Well, I know when Matt's, uh, you know, that it's, it's sometimes you, you put lines together and they just have that chemistry and that line has it. I know with Matt, um, you know, there's no analytics for, the intangibles, the compete, yeah. uh, knowing when the team needs a, a, a bump up, saying the right thing, um, going, you know, getting someone's attention who may be having an impact on, on our success. Yeah. Uh, and it's not necessarily a, you know, you know, the four fine tough guy it's, and, and what I, what, what you find when you get one of those good identity lines. And I, I know I, I'm, I moved back to Nashville. Nashville has a really good identity line with that systems line. Yeah. And Geno and, and all that. You put those type of players sometimes against some of those highly skilled guys. And they really don't like to play that that grind type of game. Yeah. And it really, what it does is it, it takes the rhythm out of some of those skilled lines. Uh, you know, Kel Clutterbuck, you know, you know, run, just – happens to run into someone on a, a and Matt Martin comes flying in. Oh, and, it just and gave everybody back. fits. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and they were really good, but they had a, you know, Casey's a really good penalty killer and, and Cal was a, an excellent penalty killer. And Matt was the one that didn't kill penalties. He was, the uh, we'd lose them in late game situations or as maybe a third, third pairing uh, penalty killer. Uh, but Matt had impact in so many other ways. He knew when we needed a bump up. He knew in the room how to get everybody's attention. Those there's no analytics. And that's sometimes where, uh, as a coach, and I know a lot of coaches, not only myself, you get, uh, uh, the media reading, you know, the analytics, you know, purely yeah. and they don't have it. They don't have the concept that you need different pieces to, to work. And I always, I always, I, I I always look at it as you're building a house. If you have a whole bunch of, of, of skilled craftsmen, your house will look really good, but it won't be very stable. You need the toilet. You, know, you, need, you, need, you need good plumbing. You need a good roof. You need, you know, good framers, uh, you know, and you need a good foundation. You need a little bit of everything. And uh, the game has gone more to speed and skill more than ever before. And I think we used to talk about top six. It's, Definitely top nine. Yeah. You got to have a top nine now. Uh, and, and we did had that when we won the cup. You, you think about, uh, you know, we had two good lines and the third line was, came up with some big goals. It was a combination of guys like uh, 
a Lars Eller with Berkowski or Conley yeah. or Smith Belly. Uh, they came up with some of their biggest goals. Uh, so having depth and having guys that can do a little bit of different stuff really is, is uh, crucial. And I know with the Island with that identity line, they can set the tone. They can change the game. You know, when you get into those uh, uh, wide open sort of light games, maybe that's, you know, that's not your an Islander strength. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, then we could pull them into that grind game and pull that team out of their strength and, and use ours against them. So that, that line had that ability. And that's, uh, I, I think I've always looked for that type of line that, that can do something, but they all have to be able to play. And if they, if they can't play, and I say that, you know, if they're lacking skill or speed, then you better have really good hockey sense and, and a hockey IQ to know when you can change the game with uh, an element that you have or be a part of a really good penalty killer or, you know, face off uh, type of guy, uh, high character, high work ethic, uh, high physicality, all those things, whatever your, your, your strength or your element of or your calling card, whatever you want to call it, as long as it's ex- exceptional and it's, it's team oriented, then you're going to have success and they can have success. If you are involved with the minor hockey association that hosts tournaments or multiple tournaments, or you're a coach who operates spring tournaments or any organization that puts on events, then you're going to thank me for introducing you to Event Connect. Event Connect makes managing and growing your sports events simple and efficient. It literally covers every aspect of the event management from scheduling, uh, linking out of town teams or visitors with hotel bookings to capturing registration fees and collecting additional revenue all on one platform. Best of all, it's free. Event Connect receives a small fee through its payment processor, but there is no upfront investment. I got introduced to Event Connect because several of our league and association partners began using them and raved about the time it saved, how user-friendly it was, and the additional revenue they were able to generate. In fact, the feedback was so positive, we began using Event Connect to host TCS Live, our annual coaching conference at the University of Michigan. It was a great decision. I know firsthand how stressful it can be to run tournaments and events and can't imagine going through that process again without Event Connect. If you want to simplify the process of organizing your tournament or event and tap into new revenue, then go to eventconnectsports.com to book a demo today. Don't go through the painful process of trying to run your next tournament without Event Connect. Go to eventconnectsports.com and get started now. Well, I'll tell you what, I vote that when Casey Sitsikas retires, the NHL should name a, an award for most entertaining four checker after him. Cause well, I, I just don't know if there's anybody that can do it as recklessly, but control it's tough to pin down, but it's, it's fun to watch. Um, and, and just sticking with, with, with that team, Barry. And I, again, I, I might be totally out in left field on this, but this is just an observation I made. And it was that, you know, with that team, it, it seemed to me that, your group was really comfortable. Um, you know, again, going back to that playoff run where you went up against some, some heavy hitters and some really good offensive teams was really poised and comfortable playing, you know, extended periods in your own zone, not giving up any shots. And, and normally the defensive teams, the team getting worn down, but it almost seemed the opposite. Like you'd almost wear the other team down and then boom, away you go on offense. And it almost, I remember watching and thinking, man, like this feels like it's not an accident. This is almost by design. It, it, it is. I, I always preach, uh, let's get comfortable being uncomfortable because that's what playoffs are. You're yeah. sitting there and you're, it's uncomfortable. <laughs> it's just is. And uh, you don't know when it's going to change. Uh, but yeah, no, it's a little bit by design. We, we, we really protected the, the middle of the ice. So there was a lot of, you know, I always say don't mistake activity for achievement offensively and defensively. Yeah, so good. And um, we would let teams, we would, we would pack it in, we would protect, and uh, teams would be on the on the outside. And, you know, we played, uh, I'm good friends with Coop in, in Tampa, and, and everybody talks about camp, uh, Tampa's forwards and how good they were. They finally got onto it a little bit last year. The, the reason that they won two cups, they were so good defensively. 
Yeah. No one ever talked about it. They, oh, they got, you know, Stamkos and Kucherov. And yeah, they can, and their power play was dangerous and they got a you know, great goalie and they got all that. But they all committed to the, that that defense and the number of shots that they, it was hard to get a puck to the net on yeah. the Tampa Bay uh, team with guys like McDonough and Hedman and that Chernak is a, is a big beast. And, you know, even Luke, uh, you know, uh, Luke Shen, who uh, has been in and out of the, he was a great contributor. They just committed. They packed it in, you know. Uh, uh, you know, they basically collapsed and they outnumbered you and they outbattled you down low. And then when it got up top, they, they basically just, you know, took care of business up top and blocked shots. And, you know, and their defensive commitment was incredible. And they, they won a couple, cup, uh, you know, back-to-back cups and, it was because their 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 commitment and and you saw that this year they weren't as good as they were the year before with uh, Goodrow and all that uh, and Coleman and that uh, Gord line they weren't quite as good but you saw in the in the, uh, in the playoffs they would block a shot barely be able to walk or get you know yeah. separate a shoulder they'd go down the runway they'd come back and they dig in and they built a great culture of commitment. Uh, and with their top players being a part of that. And, uh, you know, they're getting peeled away with the salary cap and all that. Uh, but that was the hurdle that they got through. And what I saw, you know, in, in this is my, my look at, uh, at, a, at a team. My, I saw Tampa Bay um, change the narrative on Florida this year. They played Florida, and yeah. they, they had a wide-open series the year before, and uh, Tampa was able to win. They just had a little more depth, a little more experience, but it was pretty wide open, and Florida gave them a scare. I think what Tampa, knowing their staff and knowing Coop, they changed the narrative, and they got right to their defending game right off the bat. On the road, and yeah. They, like, yeah. And they took everything away and took Florida out of their game by basically doing their lockdown uh, defensive first mode that they can go into. And they, sh- they didn't give Florida anything and Florida got frustrated, didn't have the patience and they just countered on them and countered on them and ended up winning a series. Uh, fair, it looked like fairly easily. It wasn't as easy as it, as it looked, uh, but, but uh, they just flipped the script on them because they, they recognize that, uh, you know that's that was their strength. That that was their their strength, offensively going head to head with with uh, Florida, wasn't as big as strength. It was probably a saw, you know, saw. But when they added the defensive element into it, that was their biggest strength. So they they went that way. Well, I hope for the sake of all of us that uh, they meet up in the playoffs again this year. Because what a chess match between Coop and Paul. Um, yeah, no, that, absolutely. There, there's a lot of experience. Uh, you know, I, I do know that Florida, uh, their veterans have played a lot of hockey. Yeah. Uh, in the last uh, few years, it'll be a, and without the depth that they, they, you know, they've done a good job of, uh, of replacing people, but they're, they're not as deep. And then if they get some key injuries for long, it's going to be a lot more difficult for Tampa this year. There's still, you know, you, you, when, you, when you're that good and you have, uh, those those high end players that demand a lot of the salary cap, it is very hard. Uh, plus, you have to give up assets to yeah. continue that to, to when your window's open. So they've done a good job of of really taking shots during their window, and uh, the, their management group has uh, has been excellent. You know, Barry, like I just wonder with you know the, the relationship between you and John. Um, I would say that you know you look at Tampa's team where. Um, they seem to check all the boxes. You know, they were they were tough. They had size. They had skill. Goaltending. You kind of go down the list. Very similar to the team you had in Washington. You know, where I yeah. thought you guys kind of had every sort of element. That's really tough to achieve in the salary cap era. But you know, when you go in there as a new coach, is it a, is it a I guess a process of saying, hey, here's how we're all going to play, and we all have to adhere to certain things or is there a balance there to say hey you know what everybody let's all acknowledge we got some some pretty talented players and 
they're maybe going to get a little bit more rope in certain areas. Um, what, what does that dynamic look like? Well, I, I think I look at every team uh, that I've ever gone to. Like when I went to Washington, I just, uh, and even with the Islanders, I tried to recognize, okay, I'm a coach who's coached against you. You know, I know one of the first, uh, when we got down to our team, um, I, you know, I, I, I've used a one, one, three, I've used a, a, a two, three, I've used yeah. a, you know, I've used all the systems and I try to gear whatever system, uh, that we, we're going to use as a team based on personnel, Yeah, the team that we have for me to go, okay, we're going to use this system, no matter what we have, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't work. It, it, it's got to fit and, and let's use our strengths. So, um, I felt Washington was very skilled. Um, I, I said to them, that they were the, when I got there, they were the biggest team in the league. Uh, very, they were huge, um, high, they had high skill. Uh, and I, and I said to him, I said, this is how I, I and I, from my, my, uh, playing the two games a year for a number of years against him, I said, if you look back and I, and I said, I always felt that we were going to beat you five, one, or you were going to beat us five, one. And I said, when we beat you 5-1 uh, with the teams in Nashville, I beat you, we, we, our teams beat you with our, our systematic game. Yeah. And, and your, your lack of systematic game and looseness with the puck at times in terms of time and space and, and, and commitment to both ends of the ice. And I said, I never felt, or, or you'd beat us 5-1 when you got, mad and you'd come at us physically. And I said, you know, uh, your skill would take over or your size would take over, but you never use both at the same time. Interesting. Yeah. And I said, we're going to be a heavier team. We're going to get the balance of the offenses. I'm not going to take any offense away from you. Um, I'm actually going to, we're going to have a plan to get, like I said, get the puck back when we don't have it. So we have the have the puck more, so we can do more damage offensively, but we're not going to give up free stuff that we always we tended to do, um, and it showed in terms of uh, I think the, the the team goals against was top it was probably top ten yeah the first year and then after that it was in the top two or three for the next couple of years offensively. Maybe a little downtick, but not much. Maybe ten or twelve goals. I think it was. If I, I, my memory's not serving me, it wasn't much. Yeah. But but our our goals against went down by, you know, eighty. You know, and uh, so we became a, a team that was uh, dangerous, and we won two presidents' uh, trophies, um, and it was the two years that the the Penguins won. We just couldn't get by them. And that was that learning to be uncomfortable when it's uncomfortable. Yeah. That's what we, we learned. And uh, the second time when we lost, there was a lot of pain. There was a lot of pain because we felt that we, we could have won a cup. And, and sometimes you have to hit that pain. I think Colorado hit that pain last year. And they, they had that focus. And they learned some stuff. You know, when you're winning easy, it it is you don't learn a whole lot. You yeah, don't learn so a, true. about yourself. You don't learn a lot. Uh, you have to struggle a little bit uh, to pull yourself up. You got to get knocked down a little bit before you pull yourself up. I mean, the great teams, uh, the great dynasties. I mean, the, that happened with the Islanders before they won four. They they had a really good team, but couldn't do it. Detroit, who when I got got into the league in, uh, you know, back in '98 with the, the Predators with an expansion team, a true expansion team, unlike uh, what we got going on now. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, uh, oh man, they, um, you know, they had a lot of heartache. They had great teams and would lose out, and then and then they won, and then they 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 rolled for a while. Uh, it always seems to go that way. Um, you know, it, it just does. And uh, uh, that's that's the way the league is. It's so much parody now. It's crazy. There's it's, you know. Zero it, nights off. Yeah, no kidding. Well, you you know, you mentioned the, the, the media earlier and 
you know, I look back on the year you guys won the cup in Washington and it seemed appropriate that you had to go through Pittsburgh. Like it just seemed like that, it, that needed to happen. And it was just a way better story and journey to get there. But, you know, I can recall the media made such a big deal of sort of this monkey on your back. And of course, you know, players and yourself and your staff, everybody says the right thing. Oh, it's just another series. It's day by day. Those, those cliches, but I'm like, no man, behind closed doors, there's, there, these are human beings. Like, of course that's gonna, you're gonna, there's, you're gonna feel a weight there. How did you and your staff approach that in terms of sort of just getting your, your team's mindset right before that, the puck drops and that's well, it. I think we went into it. Uh, uh, where I was, I it, it, people forget we lost our first. We started against Columbus Blue Jackets. We lost our first two Dude, home yeah. games in and overtime. Home too, was it not? Yeah, it was at yeah, home. Yeah. We went back to Columbus and won in double overtime in Game Three. And um, I, I walked into the coach's room, and uh, I said, "Guys, I'm just going to let you know that we're going to win a cup now." We just won our first playoff game in double overtime. Um, and they, they were like, okay, settle down, big boy. You know, they, I, I, they thought it was crazy. But what I what I felt, it, this was just instinct. And I had talked to Babs. I had talked to Joel Quinville, Jacques Lemaire, a uh, number of guys who won cups. And, and they had the same story that they all struggled out of the gate, should have lost the series, Want a, want a huge game, and then they started rolling. And I felt that's where we were. And I was right. And um, uh, I know in, 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 uh, in Pittsburgh, it was a back-and-forth series. And uh, people forget, I think Tom Wilson got suspended. Uh, I, Nick Backstrom had a broken thumb. He didn't play. Nick was going to try to play the game, and he came to me, and he says, I can, I can play. And I said, no, you're not, I'm not playing you. And he was like, what? I said, we're going to win. You just get ready for the next series. Come on. That's so good. Yeah. And I said, just get you, you – we get Willie back, you're back. We're, and we had, uh, I think, Nathan Walker and, and uh, uh, Boyd. And we had, like, three guys from Hershey playing that game, and they were outstanding. Um, I moved uh, Chandler Stevenson to right wing. He hadn't played right wing since – maybe ever. Yeah. I put him on the top line and, uh, I said, you're going to be great tonight. I need your, I need your wheels tonight up there and, uh, really calm. And we had a good game plan where we were, we were going to check, right. And even, and we did. And you think about the game winning goal, OV broke up the play at the red line with, with good structure, popped it to Kuznetsov and away he went and, uh, he scored in overtime. And, um, I remember after that series, that was that it, it had to be. We had to go through Pittsburgh. We would have went through anybody else uh, that wouldn't have the impact. It was getting rid of. It was an exorcism. Yeah, and uh, it really was. And uh, great way to put it. It was. Yeah. It was an exorcism of that. All those those that the heartache that Pittsburgh had inflicted on the on the Caps for decades, really. Um, but I remember once we, we, we had a, a moment and we were all hooting and hollering, I got everybody to settle down. And I said, we're only halfway. We're only halfway. You I, I can't even wrap my head around the grind. Like I just, I don't think there's few things in life, unless you've been through that, that you could relate to what a Stanley Cup playoff is. It, it is. People don't realize how consuming it is. Like, like you, there isn't a, when you're in the zone, in a playoff run like that, and you win a cup, everybody will tell you, you really don't have, you can't get out of your head. Yeah. You can't, you, 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 it's totally consuming. Uh, you're as if probably with the guy's family, they're probably not present. Um, uh, and it's two months. It's not like, you know, it's a week, you know, you got to dig in for a week or two weeks. It's two months and you're hurting and, you know, you're, you're, you're having these emotional highs and these emotional crashes every game. Like after, after a win or, you, you know, the next day you, you, you sort of crash, you feel great and you got a little juice after a devastating loss, you, you, you felt that you got mono, 
you know, yeah. you can barely move your legs, you know, you're, you're, you're mentally fried and then you, you got to ramp it up again. And, and, um, I, what I think that we, we, we learned, uh, and I, I think was able to get across to the, the players is that you, you just got to let it, you let it go. So it's just the one game. It's the first team to four. And so, you know, you, the, you look at the, uh, we played Tampa, uh, their last cup. Um, we got smoked in game five, eight, eight, nothing or eight to one in Tampa. And no one in there was thinking that we were going back to the Coliseum and going to win a hockey game. And we want to got it to game seven and then we lost in one, nothing in game seven. I mean, yeah. um, you know, in a terrific run and, and that last run that we had, uh, it couldn't have been in a, it, it was fitting that the Coliseum was, uh, was closing after that. Yeah. Um, uh, so that many people, so many people, uh, said that they, it reminded them so much of their, their youth where dad take them to the game, they're tailgating all tailgating all day. Yeah. Uh, and have a great game, find a way to win. Uh, we were losing in the third period. We were able to come back and tie it. I think it was Scotty Mayfield tied it from Barzell. And then uh, Bovillier scored in overtime real quick. I think people were a little bit, a little bit mad uh, because they went to the, get a, a fresh beer, uh, a fifteen dollar <laughs> beer, and we scored like a minute in, and you know all of a sudden the beers are being thrown on the ice, and we're ducking all that. But it was, it was a, really a special series for for Islander fans for sure, mm-hmm. and for for me. Oh, uh, I, I'm old school. I like the uh, I like the old buildings that have great history. No kidding. Well, you know, you mentioned that two month grind. I know it, it, the, the playoffs always get, um, you know, referred to as a marathon. But you know, I'm always like, man, a marathon's five hours. Big, big, big difference. Yeah. Like it's a different beast. Uh, you, you brought up, you know, the expansion format and. You know, I, I thought this was interesting and, and not to put you on the spot, but if, if we look back at the coaches that are hired for expansion teams, so Dave Haxtell, NHL head coaching experience, Gerard Gallant, NHL head coaching experience, uh, Tampa Bay, Terry Crisp, Minnesota, Jacques Lemaire, uh, Dave King in Columbus. Why did David Poyle hire a guy with no NHL experience to run his expansion team in Nashville? I have no idea, but I'm so thankful for him. Um, it was funny. I, I had talked to, to David and uh, he got like, oh, I was work, work for David for a number of years. Yeah. Uh, and we had good success in Portland. He liked what I was doing. And um, I said, when he got let go, I said, and, he, and, he, and I said, if you end up somewhere, I'd love to, you know, maybe come with you and, and be a part of that. And then he got the Nashville job, which is an expansion team. And I said, they, you know, I texted him. I said, congratulations. Or, I don't know. I don't I probably blackberried him back, back then. Uh, <laughs> There's a lot of kids just, out there right now Googling about blackberry. Yeah. You know, what, 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 what that is. Yeah. Uh, it was sort of the form of text back, back in the day. Yeah. And um, so anyways, uh, I just be a part of it and uh, you know, something new and exciting and from the ground up and he phoned, uh, phoned me, he says, uh, I'd like you to join us. And I'm thinking originally for the farm team, uh, you know, for their, okay. the, their, their farm team. And cause I was thinking they were going to go with an experienced guy. And I was going to, cause I did a, a lot of the, the signings in the minors. I, I signed all the deaf players for the Washington capitals back then. They'd give me the 10 or 12 prospects that they, they had. And what I did is I built teams around those prospects uh, so that they had good support, but also gave the cap some depth that they needed in different positions. So we had great success in, in that. So I thought I was going to be in that sort of same role. And then he said, no, coach the hockey team, the expansion team. And I had that moment of, wow. Uh, wow. Yeah, exactly. And then knowing the expansion rules as I, I did and seeing the players that were going to be available, I was like, I just want to make it through the first year. Because this is not going to be pretty. Um, I met a lot of the players uh, that we ended up taking um, actually in the press box because they weren't regulars. 
Because back then, I think they could protect 17 guys. Now he can protect, I think, max is 10, yeah. it, it, depending on the format that you go. It's either 8 or 10, depending on how many defense. what uh, half a billion dollars will get you. Yeah, yeah. So most of those guys, you think every team has one or two young guys, waiver exempt, yada, yada. The pretty slim pickings. And so um, some of the best moves that we did was David was great. David was fantastic because David said, he, he, you know, I'm thinking I want to create the best team. And I was sort of hired the year before, so I didn't even have a team. Um, I remember going to New Jersey to, to scout because uh, I was the head, supposed to be the head coach, but we had, it was a year before the team yeah. were stepping on the ice. So I was really a glorified uh, uh, pro scout. Uh, I think Buck Showalter might have did that uh, way back in the day. Uh, when they had one of the expansion uh, teams in baseball. Backs, maybe, yeah. Yeah, maybe. I think he did that. Uh, and uh, I remember going to New Jersey, and uh, I went to the, the uh, you know, the media entrance and the scouts entrance where you, where you go in, and I said, uh, yeah, Barry Trotz, uh, Nashville Predators, and she goes, I remember the lady goes, Nashville, what? And I go, Nashville Predators, they'll, they'll be in the NHL. Yeah. She goes, I says, we got uniforms and everything. It's going to be swell, you know? <laughs> going to make light of it. And she goes, okay. So I remember going up there and she put me behind the, uh, I think the uh, the guy that has the lights, the, the big strobe lights, and I couldn't see anything. That might have been that might have been Lou doing that. I, I, I said that to Lou. He said he knew nothing of it. I said, you know everything. And, uh, but, uh, I met a lot of the players up in the press box. I mean, some of the best picks that I, that we got guys like, uh, Scott Walker, uh, was great for our franchise. Um, but the best thing that we did is David said to us, he goes, listen, we're not going to be very good. Understand that. So take some chances on guys. If they're yeah. not big, if they're whatever, take some chances. This would be your opportunity to take some chances. So with that in mind, when I was scouting over in, in, uh, in Europe, I kept seeing a, this tiny little defenseman named Timo Timonen being the best player in some of these tournaments. And I'm like, Was David. he undrafted back then? No, he was drafted by, by LA in like the ninth or 10th round. When they had, I think they had 11 rounds back then. He was a late, late pick. I said, I keep going to see the Finnish team, and this guy's the best player but he's tiny. I don't know how he's going to do. And uh, there's a, a Latvian guy, uh, Carlos Skrashtic, uh, we, we picked up. Uh, um, then we, I remember uh, we got our goaltending taken care of. We had Mike Dunham. We got him from New Jersey. Um, but we made a deal with, uh, with, I think it was Montreal, in terms of not taking one of their goal, goaltenders. Got it. Uh, I think they had Theodore and Tebow, I think, uh, way back then. Um, and then we were playing against, uh, when I was in minors, Thomas Falcoon was always it was there. And, and they weren't very high on on Thomas. Uh, he was a little, little bit, maybe a little chunky. And you know, I, I, they had these pretty good French goaltenders. Uh, there was a third kid. I can't remember who the third kid was, but uh, the, the, they had the... Uh, the Theodore and Tebow and there was another kid and you know Thomas was sort of a so we made a deal to get Sebastian Borlo and uh you know not take a goalie and we got uh, I think a draft pick and we asked we said we need another goalie for for depth and yeah. so would you throw in this Thomas Falcoon they were more than willing to do that and no, he ended up being yeah. a pretty good wow. player you know really and we made player. we made a lot of deals like that that end up getting some good players, you know, that were, were better than you, you, you thought. And we, you know, we went back and got a guy named Patrick Shelberg, uh, who played in the league a little bit. And I think everybody forgot about him a little bit. Um, so we, 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 we did okay. I think, uh, the first year we won 27 or 28 games, which, uh, when you saw a roster, right? yeah. And you saw a roster at the start, I'm like, we may never win a game. Um, but we did, and it was it was a fun year. We uh, David made it all about 
family and, and, and team that we're going to have to do it. Uh, we led the league in team meetings for the opposition <laughs> after the game when they, we beat them. <laughs> That's so um, good. And uh, it, it, so we, we took a lot of pride in that. We, were, we had a, a, a great group. We knew that uh, these guys were fighting for their lives. But, you know, the one thing I learned on that expansion team, which was probably different than the expansion teams that they have going now, is that most of those guys were the extra guys. So when I, when I got really hard in certain areas or I moved them down the lineup without saying anything, they, uh, they struggled with the, that because they were always the extra guy. They were the guy that was getting sent to the minors. They were the guy that was in the press box. And I, I, it took me about 15 games to figure that out. No kidding. That wow. a guy would just sort of really fall off when you, when you got really hard with them or, 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 you know, you moved them down the lineup without saying anything. Yeah. You know, sometimes as coaches, you just, you know, this guy's not going tonight. I'm going to move this guy, flip him up. They would get affected a little more than a guy that was a, a, you know, maybe a top, you know, that he was in the lineup every night. So you didn't learn stuff like that, which I never really, you tried to think about everything, but you didn't know, you know, when people say, you know, you know, I know how you feel. I didn't know how they felt. Yeah. You know what I mean? What, what, like what, but you know, it's such, I think that's the great thing about coaching because you don't, you you can't read that in a book. You know what I mean? Like you gotta, you gotta live through that. You know, and, and uh, my, my mom passed away in January and, and I you know, used to say, oh, I know how you feel. Well, I didn't. I never had a parent pass away, but she she passed away. So now I, if someone, something like that, now I know how they feel. Yeah. You know, and, but you don't because it affects people different ways. You know, for some people it's, they can handle it really well and some people can't. They go in a shell. So I learned, uh, I tried to learn that and be conscious of that part of the, the human spirit, if you will, because we, we think players are robots. They, they, they're invincible. They, they they got this great, per, they got lots of confidence and all that. Some, sometimes you find out the guys that come out with, they have the, like the biggest personalities and the biggest confidence. They don't have any you need the, you need the hug. Yeah. And, and it's, it's a, it's a facade. It's a little bit of their, their act, if you will. So, um, that's what I, I think, uh, I would, uh, I have learned a lot is, is that part of the, you know, the human spirit. I mean, everybody wants to win. Everybody wants to do well. Um, you know, there's, there's a time to work. There's a time to play, but don't get the two mixed up yeah. in this business. Um, that type of thing. So I, I try to, I always say, you know, how do you, when you coach, I said, I'm probably a little bit like, you know, the, you know, the little bit like dad, I am, yeah. uh, I'm going to tell you what I think you might not like it, but I'm going to forget it. Cause I love you. And, uh, and we're, we're going to, we'll go back to work and, and, and try to make you a, a better player, more productive person, player, whatever. And let's win hockey games together. And uh, I try to try to say that I I I'm, I think I don't hold grudges very long, unless you I, do it's something. It's so important, yeah, and hard. Because you can you can bury a guy by not being able to let it go. And it's and it's wrong. It's wrong, wrong, wrong. And uh, I I don't want to be that guy that buries a guy because it's because I got a personal gripe with him or anything like that. So I, I don't hold any grudges. Um, I think I try to be fair and, uh, and, and uh, try to do that part of it. Uh, they, it all matters. Their families matter. The, their people. I, I always look when I coach, they're, they're I got 23 kids because I'm old. I'm an older guy now. So <laughs> they're all like kids, even, yeah. even Z, Z was the closest oh, to me. Man. So that's when you know, Hey, hey Barry, I, I listen, I, I can hear your your granddaughter in the background and I know all about trying to do podcasts with toddlers running around. Um, if you have time, we had, we had the first time we've done it, we put out a thing on Twitter and a few coaches submitted some questions. Um, yeah. But I've just got, if, if it's okay, I've got one last yeah. one and this just occurred to me, like, you know, we're talking today, you know, Barry Trotz has um, 
is up there in, in I believe the top three and wins. You got a Stanley cup, two Jack Adams awards. But do you recall the conversation you had with Kim, your wife, when you found out you were getting the job in Nashville? Because at that point, you don't know what's coming next. Like you just, you don't know. But it, I mean, man, that whatever, I don't know if it was a call or a, a Blackberry message, but it just changes the trajectory of your your life. Like, do, do you recall that that moment? I mean, it must have been so special. Yeah, actually, I do. Um, it, it, it was funny. Uh, the the Jack Button. Um, I, I'm going to go Crazy, back. Yeah. I got I got to put this story up right. Uh, Jack Button was a uh, was director of player personnel for the Washington Capitals. I was playing in Regina, and uh, he invited me to camp. And it was David Poyle's first camp. Uh, he took over the job in in Washington, and uh, I remember seeing Jack Button. And uh, David sitting up in, in the Hershey Park Arena, and I went up to thank Mr. Button for um, for the you know the opportunity to come to camp and and that. And uh, before I could get out of my mouth, I went, I, I, you know, uh, excuse me, I'm uh, and I couldn't even get my name out. And he goes, I know who you are. I brought you to camp. The only reason that you're here is that you're you're good. You're going to be a good minor league uh, leader or coach someday. And I went, <laughs> just what every kid wants to hear. <laughs> Yeah, I'm like 19 years old, and I'm like, that's really. I just wanted to thank you. I just, and I just, I, I was sort of stunned, and I said, I just want to thank you for inviting me. I make it real hard for you to send me home, and uh, and uh, he goes, I know, I know you will. Yeah. And so lo and behold, and Brian Murray was my my first coach in Regina, oh, and Brian was yeah. just got the job the year before. Um, so I had someone to talk to a little bit and he knew me a little bit. Um, but anyways, I, uh, you know, I had a good camp and I, my, I remember my, my partner was Randy Hutchinson. I sat between Dave, you were talking about penalty minutes. Uh, uh, is it Dave Holt and, uh, no, Dave Hutchinson and Randy Holt. I sat in between them. They were on my team, my scrimmage teams. And I was like, there's like a gazillion penalty minutes between you two guys. Like how, how many words did you say in training camp, the dressing room? Like <laughs> not a lot. Yeah. Not a lot. Yeah. And uh, so anyways, I got to meet Rod Langway and uh, Gaetan Duchesne was my roommate. And uh, it, it was good because he was a little older guy and I was just a young punk. Um, but I, I remember that, that whole, you know, that time that you might be a coach someday. So I, um, uh, you know, Jack Button was the guy that believed in me. He called me, and uh, when I was in, in Matt, at the University of Manitoba coaching, he asked me to scout. And then he brought me to training camp, and and uh, Brian Murray put me on the ice to to run some some stuff, uh, which was great. And then I got asked to be a a scout. So, um, and it was my wife, and I, I, it's a long story, but my wife was the one. I had a chance to go to Moose Jaw to be a assistant coach, assistant GM. And it was my, my wife who says, you know, you're young. We got a, we just had one child at the time. She goes, if you're going to take a, a, a stab at something, you, this is what you really want to do, then you should do it. And uh, let's, and I, I go in without her. She's made some great decisions for me uh, okay. because uh, she just, she's always been very supportive. Uh, we've got a very close family. Um, but she's always allowed me to follow, you know, she knows I'm a hockey nut and, uh, and that's my passion. And, and so she allowed me to, to, to follow my passion. And, uh, we've been, uh, I, I've been in the league a long time, but we looked at, uh, you know, we were in Nashville for a long time that getting, telling her that I got the job, it was a great adventure. We loved Portland, Maine. Uh, yeah. I could have stayed there for a number of years. It's a great city, great people. We had great friends. We were having great success. Um, but going to Nashville, we were we were thrilled. And we looked at it as a great adventure. And then we were there for, I had the dream job. My kids went, started grade one and finished, yeah, yeah, like it, finished college. May never and happen it, again at the rate we're going. It may never happen again. And, uh, you know, when uh, I knew uh, the last year when we were, we were, we we're going to fall short on the playoffs. Pekka Rene got hurt like two games into the year for the year. Uh, and we had uh, a 19 year old and a 20 year old goalie or 21. And uh, that's it was, great, uh, yeah. 
and we I, it was going to be very difficult. But we missed the playoffs, I think, by four points or something like that. Um, I, I thought it really made me a better coach. Uh, but I knew it was time, and I knew uh, that David was probably going to make a change. I could just by um, I, I have good instinct and just the way people phrase things. Yeah. Uh, so I actually, about a month before the end of the season, I said, David, I know I'm okay with it. And he goes, what? I says, I know you're going to make the change at the end of the season. I, I'm totally uh, okay with it. Uh, I've had a great run and you gave me this opportunity. And um, he goes, well, how do you know? I just, I said, I, I just know. And I had already cleaned out a lot of my, I had a lot of 17 years of stuff in my office. It was yeah. pretty well cleaned out at that point. You just you couldn't tell. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and so we've always had a good relationship. Uh, but going back, uh, I couldn't have done the years of coaching and uh, continuous coaching. It was about 38 years without my wife. I mean, yeah. she just, because there's times when there's a lot of stuff going on and you're not present. I mean, and every road trip, something's going to break if you're going to get in this business Yeah, at home, either, you know, the air conditioning's going to go or something's going to go and you're on the other side of the country. So she is the, she's been the rock. Um, so Barry, as I mentioned, we have, um, we asked our, our, our coaches, our membership for some questions and we picked up for it and just, we can do this at like game show lightning round speed. Um, okay. But I thought some of them were pretty in, in, intriguing. So the first one is from uh, at Got My Team, and that's our pal Leo Girard, who uh, over I'm in just, Sweden. Yeah, before you go there, yeah, just let you know my recall is not great. So, okay, go. Okay. <laughs> um, when hiring a new assistant coach, what are you looking for? I'm looking for passion. I'm looking for someone who is, is uh, loyal and someone who wants to, to, to learn. Uh, cause I want to learn from them as well. The game keeps evolving. I want them to be current. Those are the things I look for. I look for people that can challenge you and are current in, 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 and well versed in, in, in our sport. That's great. Uh, next one from Colin Siprakowski. Um, when wins are hard to come by, how do you keep youth players mentally strong and willing to keep pushing forward? I, you you got to make it fun. You just can't beat them down. I think uh, I think when you you you're winning, you can push them harder. Um, but you've got to with with youth players when they're not winning, they, they 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 their success is predicated on how they feel. What you you know what you you focus on is what you feel. So if you're focusing on the losing that you lost all these games and you do this. That's how you feel. So I've always looked at it, whatever you focus on, if it's a positive thing, that's how you feel. So you've got to get them in a good emotional state. And that's not only for youth players, but that is pros. They've got to know uh, and feel that there's a, there's an answer and there's a, there's a destination that you're getting to. That's awesome. Um, Danny Heath from uh, Mankato, Minnesota. Hardest player to game prep for that no one has ever heard of and why? Wow, that is a great question. Yeah, I thought so too. That is, that is a super question. The hardest guy to, to game plan for that no one ever that no one knows. Most of the, the top guys. Um, I would probably say I'm going to go to a sneaky good player that put up pretty good points, never was a – Big time player was Yuri Letnin. Mm. Yuri Letnin and Zuboff. And Zuboff is a Hall of Famer. Yeah. But they would jump around and their poise um, was incredible. Uh, Zuboff could, could, you could be six inches from him and he had no, no heartbeat. It was, he was calm as a cucumber. And he would just make the right play all the time. So there was no game planning for him because he just, he just made the right play all the time. And same with Yuri Letton and those two guys. Uh, uh, and they happen to play together when they won a cup. So those two guys came to mind. 
I can tell you the best, smartest player that I've ever coached that you've never heard of, or, or you might not have heard of, is uh, Vitaly Yachmanov. He played with oh, me. Yeah. Where, where was he that? In, uh, in, in L.A. He was a line mate as a rookie with, uh, with Gretz. No kidding. For a year, and then we got him in the uh, expansion draft. No kidding. Well, I'm, I'm making a note here. I'm going to look that up. That's a great. Uh, he was a, he was a, he had great stick. He had great hockey IQ. wasn't a great skater, and he wasn't overly big. But man, he he knew the game. That's awesome. And and last one here. This is a good one. This is from uh, Matt Bourgeois, goaltending guru, based in Ontario. Why was Mitch Corn a valuable asset to your team and staff? Well, Mitch Korn, I've been with Mitch for a long time. And uh, I met Mitch at the Roger Nielsen Coaching Clinic. No kidding. Yeah. Uh, just cool. like every young coach, uh, Wayne yeah. Fleming said, you know, he was the one that really got me on this path. Uh, you should, you know, go to these clinics and keep learning. And and, and I uh, ended up uh uh, watching Mitch talk about goaltending at the, 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 the Roger Nielsen clinic. And I tracked him down and I uh, became uh, friendly with him, I guess. And then uh, when I got the job in Nashville, uh, I actually, just a true story, um, I, the, the Rochester Americans, he worked for Buffalo, uh, were playing the Kentucky Thoroughblades in Lexington, Kentucky. And that was my close, the closest game to Nashville. I drove because I knew Mitch would be there. Yeah. Uh, because he was at the University of Miami, Ohio. And I, no it kidding. made sense okay. for him to be there. And I just, I got, got to the game and I was, I was scouting the game. Uh, but I ended up in the press box and Mitch says, you know, hey, uh, yeah, you're looking for, uh, you know, goaltending coaches. I can, I can probably help you, um, probably help you or give you some advice on guys that, uh, I might know if you want to uh, help you with that process. And I says, uh, no, I'm, I'm good, Mitch. I've already got my guy. And he goes, would I know him? I said, yeah, absolutely. I'm talking to him. No kidding. What a cool. And, story. and he looked at me, he, he looked at me and I went, if you, that, that was it. I, I was my, a little bit of tampering, I guess, maybe back in a, a type of tampering, I guess. And I said, I don't, I don't, I'm talking to him if I can get the right guy. And he was the guy. Well, I guess that's, that helps to have uh, tootsies down the, the road from your, uh, your right, <laughs> you're building the staff. Um, hey, Barry, this has been, I again, really appreciate you kind of going to overtime here. This has been great. And I, I know that, uh, you're going to be sitting back watching and, and, you know, we'll, we'll see what's next, but uh, you know, the game's uh, way better when you're in the trenches. So um, we'll, uh, we'll all be watching uh, what's in the future for you, but thanks so much. Well, I appreciate it. I, I think, uh, you know, uh, what you do uh, getting, you know, these type of talks, uh, you know, hopefully sharing some wisdom and I, I go to all coaches and this is something that I've learned over time. Uh, is that when you're young, you think you have all the answers and you have all the secrets, share them, share them. Even when you're young, us old guys are sharing them. Yeah. Uh, we recognize that, but when you're young, share them, that's how you get better. That's how you grow and make it your own, whatever the, the other guy's secret is or whatever secret sauce, uh, share it because that helps everybody grow. So what you do sharing all this information, uh, these talks, it's great for the game and uh, I appreciate you having me on. It's a, it's an honor. Man, really appreciate that. Thanks so much, Barry. All right, take care. The Glass and Out podcast is a The Coach's Slate production.